Okay, uh, welcome everyone. It's quarter past five, so we'll start proceedings. Uh, welcome everyone, to, also to everyone who's joining us online. I've reverted to a more primitive uh, form of technology to record this, but I hope you can uh, hear everything well. Um, today's the final IHR History of Political Ideas seminar of this academic year. And we're really delighted today to welcome Joel Isaac, Professor of Social Thought and History on the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Joel, who will be known to many in the room and online, is a historian of modern social and political thought with a particular focus on American and British traditions of social thought. Before joining Chicago, Joel was a lecturer in political thought at Queen Mary University of London, the institution whose name I'm reluctant to speak today. Um, in fact, Joel, you held the position that several people uh, from Cambridge, including me, went on to hold. He then joined the Faculty of History at the University of Cambridge in 2011, where he taught until 2017 before heading to Chicago. Joel's earliest research uh, examined how theories of knowledge drove important changes in the human sciences during the 20th century. And much of this work found its way into his first book, Working Knowledge, Making the Human Sciences from Parsons to Kuhn, published by Harvard in 2012. That book was awarded the Gladstone Prize by the Royal Historical Society. Joel's currently writing a book uh, about the relations between economics and social thought from the late 19th century to the present. Uh, the aim of that project is to look at how modern economics shaped the development of social theory and modern political thought. The paper he'll be presenting today, however, if I understand that rightly, sits slightly outside that project. The political thought of Clifford Gitt is the topic. Um, before I pass over to Joe, just a few notes, Joel, a few notes. <laughs> you can call me Joe. Joe, it is more colloquial, yeah. We have known each other for. Um, a few notes about housekeeping. As usual, our speaker will speak for between 30 to 50 minutes, a broader range. The normal uh, will break for five minutes and there'll be plenty of time for questions. We will close today at a slightly later time of 6.45 p.m. to allow more time uh, for questions for our speaker. We'll then uh, reconvene in a pub down the road and you're all very welcome to join that and the dinner that comes afterwards. Uh, but for now, all that remains is to hand over to Joel. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Wes, for that very um, generous introduction. Um, uh, it's um, I know it's something's almost perfunctory for the for the speaker to say that they're glad to, to be somewhere um, to speak at the beginning of a seminar. But uh, given the last two or two and a half years and the fact that I sort of found myself stranded in the United States for all that time and away from London and away from places in, in the UK like Cambridge, I, I know so well, it's uh, it's particularly wonderful to be to be back here and to, and to speak to all of you. Um, I, I just arrived in London this morning, although from, from Cambridge, and I, I was keen to immerse myself in London again and get a sense of the city. And fortunately, I was able to do that straight away um, because I'm staying in, uh, in East London and I came across Finbagman and thought I'd hop on the Northern Line to, to come up here. And uh, just like six years ago when I left, the, uh, the Northern Line going north still wasn't working. Uh, so uh, I just about made it here and I'm, I'm very, very glad to be Okay, so my, my subject this evening uh, is the political thought of the American anthropologist Clifford Gertz. I will argue that we can make sense of a good deal of his writing on a range of issues, from economic development to the concept of culture, when we grasp it as an intervention in a set of debates that have shaped modern political thought. Specifically, I will maintain that Gertz was concerned with an issue that has, according to me, dogged the discipline of anthropology insofar as it flows from the Durkheimian tradition of institutional, institutional analysis. That issue is simply whether sovereign power is necessary for the establishment and reproduction of social order, or whether non-political institutions and customs, what anthropologists came to call the realm of culture, can achieve that task without the sovereign state as we have known it since Hobbes. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Many social and cultural anthropologists insisted that culture could and did do what those of a more Hobbesian persuasion thought that only a state could do. In defending this kind of view, Goetz was no different than a figure such as Bronislaw Malinowski, with whom Goetz otherwise differed on methodological grounds. My general conclusion will be that this anthropological attempt to map an exit from modern politics ended up reinventing the state 
or at any rate, positing surrogates for the formative powers of the state. Now, it is worth acknowledging at the outset that my treatment of Goethe in terms of the history of political thought may seem puzzling, if not uh, indeed wrongheaded. It is possible that neither anthropologists nor historians of political thought will be congenial to such a reading of Goethe's. While anthropologists may be understandably suspicious of the suggestion that anthropological inquiry could be reduced to the categories of modern political theory, historians of political thought may wonder why Goethe should be treated as anything other than a derivative political thinker, someone whose notions of political theory, to the extent he entertained them at all, came from others. So why am I treating Goethe's writings as a fit subject for the history of political thought? I need to stress that by no means am I arguing that all of anthropology can be reduced to footnotes to the history of modern political thought, nor am I claiming that Goethe was as innovative a political theorist as the more obvious choices for the 20th century canon. However, it is the guiding premise of my paper that early professional anthropology's explicit interest in some of the central questions of modern politics, which were especially clear in the work of such figures as Durkheim, Morse, and Malinowski, continued naturally enough into the, into the age of interpretive social science, into the age of thick description and local knowledge. Teasing out that aspect of the history of the discipline seems worthwhile, even if it does not uh, account for the whole field. Another assumption underpinning my argument is that the history of post-Second World War political thought would do well to look beyond the still rather restricted group of thinkers who are treated as innovators. It is all too common to look only at those who presented themselves as political thinkers, if not indeed professors of political science or political philosophy. It is simply an artifact of disciplinary specialization, I think, that we find it difficult to include many anthropologists, sociologists, and even, dare I say, analytic philosophers under the rubric of political thought. But if we want a full picture of recent political thought, we certainly need to include them. Too narrow a focus on the history of political science or political philosophy will unduly restrict the purview of the history of late modern political thought. Our horizons need to be broad, as broad as they are for scholars of Renaissance or Enlightenment political thought. It may already be evident that I have set for myself an almost impossibly large task. Given the limitations of time and patience, I cannot hope to recapitulate the history of Durkheimian anthropology uh, and also to reconstruct the entirety of Goethe's political thought, which I hope to show is in fact quite extensive. My strategy is to give an account uh, of uh, Bronislav Malinowski's functionalism. That's my first step, because this helps to bring out my underlying claim about culture or institutions as a rival source of social order to the sovereign state. I then compare and contrast Malinowski's version of this argument with Goethe's and explore some of the tensions in both. Before turning to Malinowski, however, I need briefly to establish a crucial element of Durkheim's view of social institutions. We should note, first of all, that in the preface to the second edition of the Rules of Sociological Method, Durkheim remarks that sociology may be, and I quote, defined as the science of institutions, their genesis and their functioning. Durkheim invoked the concept of the institution because he wrote, it expresses moderately well the special kind of existence enjoyed by what he called social facts. It was, of course, a key tenet of Durkheim's methodology that institutions were irreducible to the individual psychological states of the persons who participated in them. To explain institutions in terms of individual psychology was, for Durkheim, to make unintelligible the defining mark of the institution, which was that it was felt by the individual as an external social constraint, to use his language. Durkheim therefore insisted that, <coughs> and I'm quoting him again, collective ways of acting and thinking possess a reality existing outside of individuals who at every moment conform to them. We can see already that this concept of an institution as a supra-individual constraint standing over and above each of its participants paved the way for an account of the formative power of society that did not need to appeal to the principle of political sovereignty as the necessary condition of social order. But now, and again in brief, 
we need to register a second feature of Durkheim's method. This was, <coughs> this was pointed out considerable force by Claude Levi-Strauss, uh, as the latter sought to eliminate what he saw as the weaknesses of Durkheim's approach while preserving what was uh, important about it. Durkheim famously distinguished between the causes that explain the emergence of an institution and the function of that institution. Causes need not imply function and vice versa. But Levi-Strauss forcefully argued that Durkheim, and by extension Durkheimians like Morse, did not obey their methodological precepts in practice. Durkheim's uh, elementary forms of religious life, Levi-Strauss observed, constantly collapsed together the genetic and the functional as modes of explanation. After all, if function could not be reduced a priori to a genetic account, why should all religious institutions, especially modern ones, be reducible to a set of historically prior elementary forms? For Levi-Strauss, however, this prevarication of Durkheim's was more than just an unfortunate methodological slip. He surmised that Durkheim was in the grip of a kind of all or nothing view of institutions, which was itself, while trying to escape in a sense the logic of political sovereignty, came back to it once again. Um, according to Levi-Strauss, the functional view liberated, at least in principle, from causal origins implied a kind of design or mindedness behind the operation of the institution that strongly suggested its creation by a legislator, by a founder of some kind. But Durkheim, again, according to Levi-Strauss, seemed tacitly to have understood that this was an unrealistic standard for explaining institutions and was thereby thrown back on the only alternative, which was that their emergence was in some sense random, the result of the mere accumulation of blindly observed social routines, but later coalesced into something greater, into an institution or a social fact. It is not my subject uh, here today, but Levi-Strauss's structuralism was intended to repair this instability in Durkheim's sociology by reconstructing the symbolic deep structure that guided the formation of institutions, whose source for Levi-Strauss lay not in random chance or in the heroic self-conscious efforts of the founder, but rather in universal and transcendental structures of the human mind. Okay, now to Malinowski. Contrary perhaps to expectation, Malinowski did not hide his interest in political questions as they emerged from the Durkheimian tradition. In one of his fuller statements of his theory of culture, published in the Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences in 1930, Malinowski at once signaled his fealty to Durkheim's institutionalism while also distinguishing his account of institutional socialization from Durkheim's ambiguous treatment of that topic. He declared that the primary concern of functional anthropology is with the function of institutions, customs, implements, and ideas. And that of those four elements, the real component units of cultures, this is Malinowski, which have a considerable degree of permanence, universality, and independence, are the organized systems of human activity called institutions. Every institution centers around a fundamental need, permanently unites a group of people in a cooperative task, and has its particular body of doctrine and its technique of craft, or technique or craft. Yet Malinowski rejected Durkheim's claim that institutions had any kind of autonomous existence or independent constraining power over and above the, the individuals who participated in them. Therefore, while he admitted that the central issue in the understanding of culture is to be found in the process of its production by succeeding generations, and in the way in which it produces in each new generation the appropriately molded organism, he scorned the quote, metaphysic, metaphysical concepts of a group mind, collective sensorium or consciousness, especially Durkheim's theory of moral constraint by the direct influence of the social being, that um, account I just gave you of Durkheim's. According to Malinowski, sociologists of this persuasion had simply misinterpreted the significance of Durkheim's distinction between social facts and the facts of individual psychology. This distinction did not, for Malinowski, rise to the level of an antinomy, since all it did was record the fact that, in a more or less behaviorist fashion, individuals within the same society or small group were conditioned by the same elements, such things as technologies, habits, and customs, 
and so have the same reactions to these features of their environment. I'm quoting uh, Malinowski again here. Thus, the reality of the, super, of the super individual consists in the body of material culture, which remains outside any individual and yet influences him in the ordinary physiological manner. There is nothing mystical, therefore, in the fact that culture is at the same time physiological and collective. This breezy physiological account of the basis of institutions no doubt encouraged Malinowski to argue that the fundamental human biological needs for food, shelter, clothing, and entertainment set the pace of cultural development, no matter how complex the so-called derived imperatives um, that for each society governed economic life, matters of justice, and education. But it is equally clear that Malinowski came to see culture, the complex institutional life of a, of a society, as something like a functioning modern society without the need of sovereign power to solve coordination problems. And I'm going to say a bit more about that now. Malinowski agreed with the traditional claim that culture was for man, and here I followed his, followed his gendered language, a second nature which developed his capacities far beyond those he possessed in his natural state. Indeed, Malinowski continued, culture initiated persons into the civil state without need of a constitution. Uh, here follows a, a fairly long quote from Malinowski. Culture thus transforms individuals into organized groups and gives these an almost definite continuity. Man is certainly not a gregarious animal in the sense that his concerned actions are due to physiological and innate endowment and carried on in patterns common to the whole species. Organization and all concerted behavior, the results of traditional continuity, assume a different form for every culture. Culture deeply modifies human innate endowment. And in doing this, it not only bestows blessings, but also imposes obligations and demands um, uh, excuse me, imposes many obligations and demands the surrender of a great many personal liberties to the common welfare. The individual has to submit to order and law. He has to learn to obey tradition. He has to twist his tongue and to adjust his larynx to a variety of sounds and to adapt his nervous system to a variety of habits. He works and produces objects which others will consume while in turn, he is always dependent upon alien toil. Remember the guiding premise of this um, somewhat brief discussion of Malinowski is that he's describing a modern society that universalizing some of those traits we associate with modern commercial societies. Although it remained true that, and again, I'm quoting Malinowski here, culture is primarily born out of biological needs. That claim for Malinowski licensed a strikingly modern picture of how those needs were conceived and met. In Malinowski's view, tribal society was for good and ill, as civilized, quote unquote, as modern society. It too had its own quasi-commercial sociability and was not to be viewed as backward or primitive in its institutions. For example, uh, in, in uh, his book, Crime and Custom in Savage Society, again, I'm you know, sticking with Malinowski's language here, as I'm sure you'll understand. Malinowski atta attacked the, quote, dogma of the absence of individual rights and liabilities among the savages. He noted that this dogma was at the core of the famous thesis of primitive communism, which had become an obsession for students of comparative jurisprudence in both Germany and Britain during the last third of the 19th century. The basis of the idea of primitive communism, wrote Malinowski, was, quote, the assumption that in primitive societies, the individual is completely dominated by the group, the horde, the clan, or the tribe, that he obeys the commands of his community, its traditions, its public opinion, its degrees, with a slavish, passive obedience. Malinowski insisted that even in his own time, the dogma of automatic submission to custom dominates the whole inquiry into primitive law among anthropologists. Ethnologists were working with a model of legal obligation, he said, which tacitly assumed that the modern state was a necessary condition for the existence of law. Quote, accustomed as, accustomed, accustomed as we are to look for a definite machinery of enactment, administration, and enforcement of law, we cast around for something in a savage community and failing to find there any similar arrangements, 
we conclude that all law is obeyed by this mysterious property of the a propensity of the savage to obey it. In the absence of anything that, that could be understood as law by modern standards, commentators concluded that the apparent deference of quote unquote savages to the forces of custom and tradition could only be explained by automatic acquiescence, the instinctive submission of every member of the tribe to its law. On the contrary, it was Malinowski's purpose to show that the um, so-called savages observance of the rules of law under normal conditions is at best partial, conditional, and subject to evasions. And most importantly of all, that this observance, quote, is not enforced by any wholesale motive like fear of punishment or a general submission to all um, tradition, but by very complex psychological and social inducements. More concretely, Malinowski insisted that there existed among the people he knew best, the Trobriand Island, Islanders of New Guinea, a form of what could be called primitive civil law, composed of rules with a definite, with, with a definite binding obligation, which stood out from the mere rules of custom. But what sense could be made of Malinowski's claim that pre-modern societies such as those of the Melanesians contained a system of, quote, individual rights and liabilities? Such a claim was a direct challenge to the most famous thesis of the Victorian anthropologists, which was that human history was marked by a fundamental shift from status to contract, from societies in which status was tied to wholly ascriptive kinship relations, to societies in which statuses were based on voluntary agreements between individuals enforced by positive law. In order to defend his claim about primitive civil law, Malinowski returned to the complexities of economic exchange among the Melanesians, which he had described in the book that made his reputation, Argonauts of the Western Pacific of 1922. In Argonauts, Malinowski had focused his attention on the Kula, the elaborate system of ceremonial exchange that linked tribes across the Trobian archipelago. The Kula was highly ritualized since it was regulated by a dense collection of rules and conventions, including various magical rites and public ceremonies. Yet these apparently purely symbolic rituals, which centered on the circulation of shell necklaces and bracelets, provided the infrastructure, as Malinowski argued in Argonauts, for a vast range of economic production and exchange, from the trade of fish and vegetables to the building of the canoes necessary to carry on hunting, trade, and the Kula itself. What the Kula did brilliantly, as Malinowski saw it, was to create a, create a set of obligations and reciprocal exchanges among the Trobrianders that solved the basic economic problem of life, but which, as a carefully constructed system of rights and obligations, could not be reduced to the pure exchange of utilities posited by the marginal theory of value of the neoclassical economists. The Kula, quote, presents to us a new type of phenomenon lying on the borderland between the commercial and the ceremonial an expression and expressing a complex and interesting attitude of mind. In Crime and Custom, Malinowski extended this argument to cover almost every aspect of the life of the primitive community, not just the Kula, but canoe building, the organization of tribes into moatees, the tears of the widow in mortuary rituals, and the rules of marriage. All of these institutions had a crucial legal side insofar as their performance created a dense network of mutual obligations among those who participated in them. This was why, according to Malinowski, one could speak of individual rights and liabilities. In giving a gift or helping with the construction of a canoe, one became entitled to expect an equivalent service or action in return. While in receiving a gift um, or aid, one acquired the duty to reciprocate. To witness these exchanges was to understand their, quote, social function in safeguarding the continuity and adequacy of mutual services. Malinowski's basic point was that it was wrong to think of societies in binary terms as being either modern or, pre, excuse me, as being either pre-modern or modern, not from status to contract, but always status and contract. This was the lesson of Malinowski's anthropology of law. Anthropo uh, Malinowski, therefore, had no compunction about describing primitive societies, you know, to use his language, as defined by the division of labor, 
and as bound together by a delicate tissue of civil rights organized around property, the labor process and exchange. He went even further towards merging the pre-modern and the modern. Contrary to other anthropological depictions of tribal societies, Malinowski's trobrianders were not mindlessly attempting to satisfy basic needs, nor were they mere puppets of the rules and structures that guided their lives. They were mentally and emotionally complex. In Rousseau's terms, which um, Malinowski doesn't use, but I think he comes very close to um, recreating, they had already shown their capacity for perfectibility, the development of mental faculties and the refinement of appetites and desires. They thought about the laws that govern their transactions with one another, about how to evade them, and about the costs of getting caught. Quote, whatever the native can evade, excuse me, whenever the native can evade his obligations without the loss of prestige or without the prospective loss of gain, he does so, exactly as the civilized businessman would do. Two considerations kept the Trobrianders more or less in line. First, quote, enlightened self-interest, according to which the keeping of an obligation was clearly better than the alternative. Obeying the dictates of the Kula or marriage rights meant that one would be obliging others to provide one with the needed services. More negatively, um, a consistent refusal to reciprocate would consign the individual in question to social opprobrium and perhaps even banishment. They would be cast out of the civil order and left to the state of nature, a prospect few in Melanesia or anywhere else could contemplate with equanimity. Besides self-interest, the other factor keeping the Trobriander's sense of legal obligation in place was, quote, obedience to his social ambitions and sentiments. The Melanesians linked power with wealth and wealth with the ability to give gifts and feasts of great extravagance. Quote, nothing has greater sway over the Melanesian mind, Malinowski wrote, than ambition and vanity associated with a display of food and wealth. Generosity is the highest virtue to him and wealth the essential element of influence and rank. The association of a semi-commercial transaction with definite public ceremonies supplies another binding force of fulfillment through a special psychological mechanism, the desire for display, the ambition to appear muni munificent, the extreme ex esteem for wealth and for the accumulation of food. Malinowski was here clearly undermining the very idea of a careful developmental sequence of stages leading from the primitive order to the modern commercial state. Yet this erasure of the difference between the primitive and the modern, between so-called natural man and political society, also foreclosed on the possibility of novelty or historical change. For Malinowski, the fundamental elements of culture, religion, magic, myth, law, language, kinship, were not governed by their own unique internal logic. These were derived or secondary imperatives, dictated by the primary imperatives of food, sex, and shelter. In short, the basic human desire for safety and ease. The necessities of life were the source of the reproduction of society, with institutions thus rendered the vehicle of, the, of those basic needs. From this perspective, the quasi-commercial or selfish social sentiments that Malinowski attributed to his Trobrianders could never serve as the basis of further psychological and historical development governed by uh, its own open-ended principles of change. This was a radical departure from earlier theorists of ambitious, uh, ambition and status seeking among the members of commercial states. No modern state, no history. Malinowski would not have minded that conclusion. So now finally on to Gertz. Gifford Gertz began his career writing about religion and economic development, not politics. His doctoral research on the religious traditions of Java fit perfectly with his training in Harvard's Department of Social Relations. Devoted to the study of the modernization process, social relations with Talcott Parsons at its helm sent its graduate students into the field to look for the equivalence of the social changes that led to the rise of capitalism in the West. In search of an Indonesian analog of Weber's Protestant ethic, Gertz found an approximation in the worldview of the reformist Muslims, the Santri of East Central Java. In later work, 
He compared incipient trends toward capitalist enterprise in Java with the uh, aristocratic society of Bali, with an eye towards explaining the possibilities and limits of economic development in Indonesia. Thus, Goethe's early work was profoundly engaged with questions of economic development, but he soon turned to issues of political philosophy, questions of the state and its legitimacy, and whether sovereign power was a necessary precondition for the creation and reproduction of social order in complex developing societies. The immediate prompt for Goethe's engagement with politics was the Committee for the Comparative Study of the New Nations at the University of Chicago, a boondoggle of sorts for the social theorist and institutional power broker Edward Schills. The committee gave Goethe, who was recruited to Chicago by Schills in 1959, an opportunity to extend his analysis of the cultural aspects of social change into the study of politics. Such was the aim of the essays collected in the fourth and largest part of Goethe's classic book, The Locus Classicus of the Interpretive Social Sciences, The Interpretation of Cultures of 1973. The most important political essay in that volume, The Integrative Revolution, Primordial Sentiments and Civil Politics in the New States. In that essay, Goethe took his cue from Schills. Schills sought to replace uh, Ferdinand Tonis's classic distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft with the fourfold distinction that split Gemeinschaft for what Schills called the primary group into three distinct categories, groups based on primordial attachments of kinship, place, or language, groups based on personal attachments as among soldiers thrown into battle who fight more for each other than for the larger cause, and finally, groups based on ideological affinity or charisma, as in the case of a religious sect or revolutionary vanguard, what Weber called the Bund, the kind of closed group. Within Schills's schema, Gesellschaft remained the realm of citizenship, which promised formal legal status, but lacked the strength of the ties of the primary group, according to Schills. For Schills, the challenge for modern state-centered politics was to stabilize civic attachments by at once harnessing the socializing powers and neutralizing the negative effects of the three forms of primary group, the three, three forms of Gemeinschaft. When he turned his attention to the post-colonial nations, Schills noted that civil sentiments there were weak, if only because they were so new, while primordial attachments, to use his language, were unusually strong. Goetz ran with this idea but added his own twist. The tension between primordial forms of sociability, blood language territory, and the paler attractions of civic politics was greatly aggravated by the twin imperatives of the post-colonial polities. Quote, the peoples of the new states are simultaneously animated by two powerful, thoroughly interdependent, yet distinct and often actually opposed motives. The desire to be recognized as responsible agents whose wishes, acts, hopes, and opinions matter, and the desire to build an efficient, dynamic modern state. Although in the ideal type of a nationalist movement, those two desires would be realized together in the form of the ethnically homogeneous nation state. In the new state, Goethe wrote, these motives tended to pull apart from one another. The desire for recognition of one's identity pointed toward, quote, the gross actualities of blood, race, language, locality, regional tradition, while the desire for statehood implied the need to subordinate these specific and familiar identifications in favor of a generalized commitment to an overarching and somewhat alien civil order. The state at once threatened primordial, ident primordial identities while, whilst also increasing competition among ethnic and kinship groups as they vied for control of the state a new and powerful prize within these societies. Hence, the main political challenge of the new states was to find a way of transforming the primordial and the civic so that the two imperatives of the politics of the post-colonial states, rather than heightening parochialism, could somehow be integrated in the name of a project of national unity. This was the integrative revolution that these states would have to undergo, according to Goethe, and ominously, and they would have to undergo this revolution at the same time that they face the social revolutions of industrialization, urbanization, and restratification. 
This basic problem of reconciling Gesellschaft with the post-colonial state's peculiar forms of Gemeinschaft was at the heart of Goethe's political thought throughout his career. But, and here I'm kind of you know, moving towards a conclusion, how exactly would this integrative revolution come about if the state was such an alien graft onto so-called primordial social sentiment? It is on this question that the political dimension of Goethe's famous semiotic conception of culture becomes clear. In the integrative revolution, Goethe did not fully draw out the implications of his cultural theory, but he hinted at them in his suggestion that the route to the integration of the civic and the primordial lay in what he described as the so-called domestication of primordial sentiments, or elsewhere as the modernization of ethnocentrism. Primordial ties, Goethe wrote, had to be reconciled to the unfolding civil order by divesting them of their legitimizing force with respect to governmental authority and by neutralizing the apparatus of the state in relationship to them. This was to be done by transforming brute essentialist identities into ethnic blocks on the model, although Goethe did not say this outright, of the post-war United States. Will Herberg's famous study of the ethnicization of American society, a book called Protestant Catholic Jew, hovered in the background of Goethe's remarks. The creation of ethnic blocks would not remove conflict from the political system, but rather, as Herberg argued, channel it into a less corrosive form, basically team politics, as it were. The question remained exactly how the modernization of primordial, lo primordial loyalties was to be achieved. Goethe's essay on ideology as a cultural system of 1964 gave the answer. Uh, this, this essay was based on Goethe's attempt to make the science of symbolic action, as he called it, the key method in social research. He characterized rituals and institutions, these fundamental elements of culture, as symbol systems through which individual agents interpreted and acted upon the world. Quite simply, these were vehicles for cognizing experience and organizing one's moods and emotions, just as Goethe's great inspiration, the symbolic theorist Suzanne Langer, had argued. It was helpful, he wrote, to think of symbolic systems, religion or ideology or art, as, to use his language, programs. They provide a template, this is uh, Goethe, they provide a template or blueprint for the organization of social and psychological processes, much as genetic systems provide such a template for the organization of organic processes. Goethe asserted that the central rituals of religion, a mass, a pilgrimage, a corrigan, are first and foremost symbolic models of a particular sense of the divine, a certain source of devotional mood, and their continual reenactment tends, uh, which their continual reenactment tends to produce in their participants. But these cultural systems were not fixed. The world in which these symbolic networks operated could change, thereby rendering the existing program in some way limited or obsolete. New symbolic connections could be made through the use of such rhetorical tropes as metaphor, autonomy, and irony. Ideology in particular was in the business of manufacturing new meanings and thereby providing new models in terms of which to interpret and act upon reality. Never of course with any guarantee that such attempts would not misfire or have bad consequences. Quote, it is through the construction of ideologies, schematic images of the social order that man himself for better or, uh, that, that man makes himself for better or worse, a political animal. In short, if primordial sentiments were to be made safe for politics in the new states, they had to be ideologized. They had to be converted from obstacles to civic politics into the very means of such politics. Whatever else uh, ideologies may be, Gertz wrote, projections of unacknowledged fears, disguises for ulterior motives, phatic expressions of group solidarity, they are most distinctively maps of problematic social reality and matrices for the creation of collective conscience. Goethe's symbolic theory of culture described a power that lay deeper than and provided the conditions of possibility for political institutions. Once again, in some sense, culture trumps the, the state as the motor of the formation of social order. The idea of the ethnic bloc or other basic primordial identities 
had to be rendered into a model for political action, most likely through the metaphoric connection of traditional models of social life with modern conditions. In fact, this was just what Gertz glimpsed in Indonesia in his fieldwork in the early 1960s, uh, importantly before the purges of 1965 to 1966. To be sure, Gertz already recognized that this process was to some extent being reversed as primordial political affiliations began to overwhelm Indonesian society. Still, Gertz noted how the classical Hindu conception of government, based on the principle of the exemplary center, had survived through the period of, of uh, Islamification and was now the subject of several attempts to, quote, construct an essentially metaphoric reworking of it, a new symbolic framework within which to give form and meaning to the emerging post-war Republican polity. If there was to be a viable politics in post-revolutionary Indonesia, it was to come through such ideological modes of politics. The workings of the culture would have to ground the state. Sovereign power alone could not do it. And in fact, for Gertz, egregiously so, because the roots of the state were so weak. It is worth emphasizing here, and again, to bring the discussion to a, to a close, what Gertz was doing in contradistinction to Malinowski. So here I, I recur to my earlier discussion to Malinowski. Broadly speaking, Gertz accepted Malinowski's claim that culture was the source of social order, since it was what bound persons together and socialized them, even as they often strained against the limits of their institutions. Uh, in Malinowski's work, basically by being uh, cynical, in Gertz's work, by using these kind of tropes that could change cultural systems or programs. But Gertz took two important steps beyond Malinowski. First, he cut culture entirely loose from biological needs. Or perhaps one should say he snapped a few more chords connecting the two than Malinowski could allow. The latter had a sequential view of this relationship between biology and culture. First, the physiological development of the human animal with its basic needs then institutions to develop, uh, developed to meet those needs in forms that, while varying in their outward aspects, served the same basic function. Hence Goethe's, oh, hence, hence, sorry, Malinowski's specification late in life of a list of so-called universal institutional types. These appeared in a book importantly called um, Toward a Science of Culture. Goethe stressed instead, instead how little of human behavior was programmed by genetics or universal biological needs, and how much cultural systems have been involved in the development of homo sapiens alongside physiological factors. Given the hypertrophy of the human nervous system, the only way humans could act intelligibly at all was to, quote, rely more and more heavily on cultural sources, the accumulated fund of significant symbols. We are in some incomplete or unfinished animals who complete ourselves through culture, and not culture in general, but through highly particular forms of it. Dobuan and Javanese, Hopi and Italian, upper class and lower class, academic and commercial. It followed that there were no commercial universals of the kind that Malinowski envisaged. The second step followed from the first. If there were no cultural universals, and if symbolic systems were always particular, and also subject to reworking and obsolescence, thanks to the self-conscious instituting actions of individuals. If this were true, then there could be nothing so general as Malinowski's primitive civil law or state-like culture with its accompanying forms of quasi-bourgeois sociability. Where Malinowski saw status and contract, pre-modern and modern, mixed together everywhere, Goethe's vision was more localized and fragmentary. Yet, as we have seen, the starting point of his writings on political anthropology was the brute fact of the existence of the post-colonial state and the challenge of giving persons civic motivations when they had only primordial sentiments to draw upon in attempting to relate themselves to the state. In that respect, Goethe took the modern state more seriously than his functionist predecessors, who, as we've seen, at least in Malinowski's case, tried in some sense to dissolve it altogether. Um, his view, Goethe's view of the adaptation of cultural systems, and especially the possibilities inherent in the process of the metaphor-driven ideologization of primordial, primordial identities, suggested the possibility of a healthy institution-led development of sociability. 
Therefore, by embracing a particularist and historicist view of culture and institutions, Goethe replaced Malinowski's vision of a natural but still fractious sociability with a more plastic view of human social propensities, which would depend on the context and scope for specifically symbolic action. In the end, however, Goethe chased, uh, chafed, as did so many anthropologists, against the nation state as the standard against which the politics of the, of the modern world should be judged. During the latter part of his career, Goethe devoted a number of studies to showing how provincial the post Hobbesian view of politics was when the polities of the global south were taken into account. The entire logic of nation state centered political theory, he argued, had to be replaced with a more neutral language that allowed for cultural difference and radical ideological change, a language of country and town instead of nation and city. In a word, Goethe had given up on the state as the proper vehicle for politics, a gesture that I guess I've been hinting at had been constitutive of a certain strand of anthropological theory since Malinowski. The goal of the new truly postmodern political theory was to embrace the universalization of particularity and difference, to embrace the logic of what Goethe called a world in pieces. Goethe returned to the pre-colonial Balinese state in uh, the book Nagara, the theater state in 19th century Bali. Notably, when he did so, he had given up on the idea that this model of a state without sovereignty, as powerful as it was, could be metaphorically reworked in a productive way for modern Indonesian politics. At best, for Goethe, the Balinese theater state was an interesting countercase in political theory an example of the persistence of charismatic power in a sense, uh, not a program that could be leveraged into a stable form of national politics. In that case, however, I may simply note, uh, and this truly is the conclusion, that the realm of culture or institutions was no longer doing what Goethe or Malinowski had hoped it would do. That is, supply an independent principle of authority or legitimacy that could stabilize a modern complex society without relying on sovereignty. Indeed, from a certain angle, Goethe's world in pieces looked less like an amiably pluralist world order and more like the unhappy cycle of division and conflict that occurred when the logic of ethno-nationalism was coupled with the logic of the sovereign state, namely the constant crisis of a divided mankind. At least, if the formative power of symbolic systems could no longer be expected to prepare people for civil life, it was unclear why culture could not just as easily be a source of rivalry and social enmity as a motor of social integration. I've been driving at the thought that anthropology, at least in some of its modes, um, had, thought, um, had thought it had found an alternative to the state, but that the ways in which this alternative has been framed sounds rather a lot like themes historians of modern post hobbesian politics have been concerned with for a long time. My closing thought is just that this conclusion, if it is plausible, and you know, I should stress this is a somewhat experimental set of arguments, that this conclusion, if it's plausible, is not meant as a snide rebuke or cynical observation about the return of the repressed. These anthropologists, um, particularly anthropologists of Goethe's generation, including people I haven't discussed in the paper, but I could be happy to talk about it in the Q&A, these anthropologists were working at a time of the disintegration of empire and the rise and crisis of the post-colonial nation states. Um, these were anthropologists who had to make their way um, and countries that had to make their way within a deeply unequal and exploitative world system dominated by the states of the global north. Novel ideas were called for in political and international thought. And Goethe, for example, used new ideas from semiotics to try to meet the challenge. Um, but in that world, the range of answers one could give and their plausibility was necessarily circums circumscribed by the kind of complex, if not attractable, political world that it was. And I think that the limits of Goethe's political thought, if indeed there are the kinds of limits I've described, reflect that kind of circumstance. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there.
Thank you, Joel. Uh, lots to think about there. And the first thing I learned was that I've been pronouncing Goetz's name wrong for my entire life. Um, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Someone may come online or something tell me, but I believe it's Goetz. Um, so I think we'll break for a couple of minutes just to give you a breather. Um, there are lots of questions in the queue already. So I'd suggest we reconvene at eight minutes past six uh, and then the floor will be open. Uh, where is it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, for the and also not. Okay. It was just on. How many? Just I think it was probably about forty-five. Oh, wow. okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to have to say that again because I was muted. Uh, let's reconvene for discussion. We have till quarter to seven, so plenty of time uh, for questions, which is good because there are quite a few already. Um, let's take someone from the room first. Uh, you'll get your turn, Paul. <laughs> uh, it's not a policy of stopping Paul asking the first question. It's just that, Georgios, you had your hand up when I... <laughs> I, 
No, I'm just going to turn the camera around so people can see. Oh, sorry. Um, so, three things. Um, I'm not confident. One definite question. There is obviously a, an absolute confidentiality between the terms and um, the because uh, that you're interested in um, throwing down sort of parallel because the ponies uh, the uh, there is between the Selma chapter and my chapter, and the fact that they are the whole. Right. And, and, yeah. and of course, ponies is in a translation. Yeah. Uh, so there's an actual you know, tangible connection there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Second point is, yeah, listening to that, it was for me, um, it's like, wow, these guys really are just reinventing the 18th century sociability debate. Except, of course, they're not just doing that, because for the reasons you said at the end, and um, their frame of reference is the first one. Um, yeah, but they're going to get one more way or another. Whereas, of course, in the 18th more about explaining the origins. The pivot point of the 18th century century debates is the quality of qualified about large and last day society. Nobody in those debates denies that human beings are able to form bonds and community and small scale societies. And they disagree about how that plot or legal bonds so in the state nature, human beings social. The problem is that once they try and grow their societies to the size of the and so I'm just wondering to what extent does that key move get them to ignore that? And it sounded, I wasn't planning to go into detail, it sounded like it doesn't, because they've got a more complex set of considerations about symbolism, about religion. So, so that would be an interesting difference. Between the, two. the third question is, is actually just what happens next and in terms of who goes into the system. Sort of representative for me because I am interested in some more recent anthropological work. What we start with is Jake Scott, um, who, of course, is the sort of poster boy for the anthropologists who reject the modern Western state as the archetypal form and very much wants to push the narrative that in Southeast Asia, that for thousands of years we were held out against this state, and they may still be holding out against it now that we're going to learn from them. And certainly we want to. Avoid the mistakes of what we call high modernism and the whole stuff and seeing like state. But the end point of James Scott's career is, is the latest book, I think it's the latest book, Jim Scott's book, which is the Roman Swamp Adlet, which is James the Great, great yeah, yeah. where he's basically saying it was all a big wrong turn in the agricultural revolution. Yeah. The people were better off 6,000 years ago. And that, if that there's a way of reading that's the column. I, mean, I don't know, right? Maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with the rest of that background yeah. anthropology. Yeah. But if that's where it ends up. That's an interesting place for you know a sort of epilogue to your story. But the most prominent contemporary anthropologist who's in that anti state Spain ends up basically saying that we're all went wrong when we started domesticating animals yeah. and growing corn. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a very dramatic conclusion to yeah. come to, of course. But he follows through on it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I, you know, that's sorry, Joel, one second. So uh the sound is not <laughs> that great. So if you could, you know summarize Paul's <laughs> very long okay. question before you answer for our audience. Okay, good. All right. So so three things. There's the, the connection with Bernard Antonis and particularly the way in which Schills and Gertz are playing with the Gemeinschaft, the Gesellschaft distinction, which is something like the Union Concord distinction in Hobbes translated. So yeah, I mean yes. In fact in an earlier version of this paper I kind of note that. Um makes that he does I've never been hunted sure. Tony scholars disagree. Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's not that he's making it up, but I, I've read in some of the literature on Tony's scholarship, and they would say that there's no direct path oh, from yeah. the work on Hobbes and the Concord distinction to Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, and it's just a much more complicated and mediated yeah. story. I've always wondered about that. Right. But I think when you get to the 20th century, that distinction is being used in a very Hobbesian way. So I think it's okay to work with those terms. That's the first question. And, you know, that's, but that, that, that's helpful. So I'm certainly aware of that. Um, um, then you have, you have a question about the 18th century angle and the importance of the idea that any society can achieve some degree of development, but is it long and lasting? That's the key. And what did, what did Gertz and anthropologists think about that? Um, and then the third question is what happens next? Okay, so for the 18th century angle, long and lasting is the key. It's certainly true, I mean, even when Malinowski is writing really at the height of the mandate system in Africa, 
um, and uh, the, the kind of principle of, of dual authority, you know, a, a blend of, of, of imperial and, and local law. Um, it's clear that, um, the, that the British Empire is, is as it were, beginning to break up, and 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 um, uh, Alonovsky is already looking beyond empire to the societies that will come, and that's why when he looks at the Trobriand Islands, he comes to the conclusion that well, this is kind of like a quasi commercial society defined by the division of labor and complex social politics and so on, kind of like the societies we're used to. So that's almost a, a comforting kind of form. When you get to the post-war period and this very rapid, you know, end of empire, collapse of these various attempts that people like Fred Cooper have written about to create a system of federation, particularly kind of federal French empire, and to, to, to bring citizens of the former French colonies in Africa into a kind of federal union with France. When that fails and you get nation states all of a sudden, all of these anthropologists recognize that that means you ain't gonna get long and lasting. And in fact, what you have is constant change and not just that, but constant political change that's then compounded by um, uh, economic and social change. I mean, um, the people who are, you know, um, streaming off the land, leaving agriculture to come and work in the cities for the, for the promise of, of manufacturing jobs that often aren't there, you know, happens in an enormous way very quickly. There's, there's um, rapid population growth during the same period um, and, and concentration of that population. And then, and then also you have this kind of complex, actually it's not so complex, but um, very mixed integration of the economies of post-colonial states into the global economic system. So something like Indonesia, um, half of its economy is devoted to cash crops for export. Um, that sector of the economy is hyper-commercialized, but um, doesn't require much labor. And, and then there's this kind of domestic sector of the economy, which is focused particularly um, in, in Java on rice agriculture, which absorbs a ton of labor, but is completely unproductive. And you have this kind of either or situation where these post-colonial states are like, they, they have this, they're directly plugged into global commerce, but through this hyper-developed sector, which does nothing for the rest of the population. So all of those things are happening at once. So long and lasting isn't, that's not what you're gonna get. But what I, I would say a, a generation of anthropologists, and I mean, American anthropologists in this period, what they, I love the language they use is, and this sounds sort of generic, but it was actually a term of art for them, which is complex societies or um, complexified societies. And what they mean by that basically is societies that have, you know, urbanization, industrialization, integration into the global system of commerce, the modern state, but all in very, very um, kind of patchy ways. Um, Gertz talks about the anthropologists in this post-war period needing to take a journey into history because the only way you can understand any of these states is not just by you know rocking up and doing field work in you know uh, East Central Java, which is what Gertz does initially, um, uh, but you have to do history. And so these figures all in fact do become historians and Gertz and Sidney Mintz and Eric Wolf all, all, all take what they call a kind of journey into history. Now Gertz represents a particular, I would say liberal weekly developmentalist version of that but it's still something they're all deeply aware of. So not long and lasting, but like we're gonna be living through this for a long time because we're getting all of these rapid kind of breakneck changes in these states um, that are gonna be having knock on effects and crises for, for the foreseeable future. And then just finally, what happens next? And I, I should be um, brief just because I don't um, have a tendency to talk too much. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Gertz and Scott are very close. Uh, uh, Scott gives, um, Gertz, the manuscript of the moral economy of the peasant, which of course is, is this study of um, uh, so-called peasant revolt in Southeast Asia, in Burma, in Indonesia, in particular, um, in the 1920s and 30s, I guess. Um, he gives the manuscript to Gertz, and in fact, they, they, share, they, they both share a field of interest in Indonesia, but also many similar kinds of interests. Although, as you say, Scott, in some sense, becomes the radical. Now, my, my twist on that is that the concept of moral economy is basically near Malinowski. That account I just gave you of primitive civil law, that's the traditional moral economy with the slight adjustment 
that um, uh, that Scott wants to import late 19th century juridical socialism, specifically Anton Menger's view of distributive justice, the, 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 the rights of the laborer to the whole of their produce, like those ideas, those ideas of fair exchange, or fair balance of exchange into anthropology. So that takes them ultimately in a more radical direction. But look, in the end, the fact that Scott ends up saying all modernity, you know, basically like agriculture was the wrong term is the logical endpoint of like anthropology's attempt to map out this exit from modern politics. This just means just Rousseau versus Smith. Okay, good. Rousseau versus Smith. I'll take that. Yeah, it's just down to the you know the calendar uh speed population on the agriculture. It's it's just to me like it's the same. And this is kind of what I'm trying to trying to get at in this project is you know I know I know early modern to this before, but well there's two books you can read. Okay, good. All right, all right, all right, thank you. Paul, just well, because no one can yeah, hear yeah. you from over there, but you're very welcome to come closer later on. Um, okay, uh, George asks, uh, like, can I ask if all questioners speak uh, quite loudly? Uh, I'm a peasant from Crete, so I am very loud anyway. Um, <laughs> um, my questions have increased now into two, I'm afraid, because of something Paul said that reminded me of a journey into history, but they will be very brief. The first was, um, does Geertz have a theory of elites? Does, what is the role of elites in that process of modernization of uh, primordial loyalties? How conscious it is, how deliberate it is, how organized it is? And the question that arose when uh, Paul uh, mentioned uh, Hobbes is, um, I was thinking of going much earlier to the 14th century, and I was very curious if you have found any evidence of him having read or reflected on or commented ever on Ibn Khaldun, because here you had somebody thinking of groups and tribes and uh, uh, formations, uh, larger formations and city versus uh, um, nomadic life and so on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, so the role of elites and uh, Ibn Khaldun. Um, I'll take the, the last question first. He definitely mentions him in, you know, Gertz already, I mean, you know, his, his first book um, compares different forms of religion in, uh, in Java, um, including, and importantly, because this is the central part of the history of, you know, um, uh, Indonesia, as I understand it from Gertz and others, is the process of, his, of his Islamification. He then goes to Morocco as a second field site. Partly because he can't go back to Indonesia because of the purges, it's not it's not safe to go back. Um, and he writes more about um, uh, about about Islam ideology and political change. So he, I know he's talked about Ibn Khaldun, but what you've done is suggest that there might be actually a direct connection between Khaldun and then some of the issues he's raising in what I'm calling his kind of politics or political form. And that I just need to think about more carefully because. Um, there could well be connections I ought to draw further and have been perhaps a little bit too obsessed with thinking about Smith and Rousseau or some of those, some of those frameworks. So I should go further back. So thank you for that. Um, on the role of elites, um, uh, Gertz, um, he doesn't write, I'll put it this way. I, I don't think he has a, 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 a strong sense that elites, are in a position to enact the kinds of changes he thinks will be necessary to um, create some, some kind of stable social order in the new states. Um, by which I mean, you might think when he describes this, the, the need for a kind of ideologization of politics, um, which is to say, you know, taking some of these so-called you know, ethnic and religious identities and making them generic enough that they can that they, that they can provide the basis for a kind of team politics rather than a kind of you know so soil and blood let's say kind of politics. Um, when he describes those processes, it's always about to some degree party elites trying to control the process, and they're always escaping them. Um, so and and he sees this happen with the Nagara concept, which he eventually writes about in his book on you know how the political theory of, of 19th century Bali can speak back to modern Western political thought. But he recognizes that the idea of the exemplary center and how that could become the basis for a kind of um, a non-politically vicious 
um, uh, national ideology, he sees that that's failed. And that's because, again, uh, elite leadership, I think for him, tends to be, tends to be fairly weak. So it's only, I think, to, to that extent that if he's theorizing elites, and I won't say any more about this, but I mean, someone, a, 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 a skeptic might say, but there is an assumption in much of Keats's work, particularly on economic development, that hovering somewhere uh, in, in the back are American um, economic and political advisors to many nations who do have a role in creating the conditions in particular for economic stability. And it's certainly true that, that Gertz moves in those worlds, and in that sense, might take the actions of those persons for granted. Although, again, he doesn't think there's anything like a simple recipe for development, like just give foreign aid to Indonesia to solve the problems it faces. Because I mean, the whole point of this theory of cultural change is um, uh, that could exacerbate the problem rather than solve it. So, so is that. Quentin. Well, thank you, Asim. Uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, I, I can hear you, Quentin. Very good. Well, I, I've got a, a, an observation, if I may, as, as well as a straightforward question. Uh, um, I mean, if Paul's allowed three questions, I'm allowed two. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. um, well, uh, it, it's about your suggestion that actually he ends up with the state. And I just wondered if you feel that um, this actually happens even in the Nagara book, uh, because, I mean, surely the, the payoff there is that in Bali, rituals are not the trappings of power, as he thinks of them as being in Western conceptions of the state. So what are they? Well, when he has to give the answer, as he does at the end, he says, well, they are what make you powerful. They are what, if they're successfully successful, if they're sufficiently grand and elaborate, they are what retain you in a position which is unassailable as the leader of the society. But isn't that the Western view of the state? I mean, isn't that actually about power in the sense that he thinks he's not talking about it? I've always found that a difficulty about the end of the book. I'd love to know what you feel about that. My straightforward question is fascinating about how he's asking Malinowski's question, that's to say um, about whether culture can be an ordering force. Um, and as you rightly say, he goes, he goes far off in, in, in a very different direction with the, the notion of a science of symbolic systems. Um, but what I've always wondered there is that there's someone whom he never seems to talk about, but who, who seems to me constantly to be hovering in his thoughts. I mean, uh, um, a useful hero of mine, which is why um, I feel that I could hear him hovering, um, is Kassira. Thank you so much for, for those, for those, plenty, uh, for those uh, questions, Quentin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best with them. So Kassira, um, certainly he, he read him. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, I think, all too briefly in the in, in the um, paper, Gertz is I think great great inspiration when he comes to think about symbolism and symbolic action as the key concept, certainly for anthropology and, and as a method in social science, is uh, Suzanne Langer's book Philosophy um, in a New Key. And Langer, of course, I mean, was he studied with Casira, and indeed really did become. Uh, one of Kassira's chief, uh, as it were, exponents and, and advocates in, in, in the post-war United States, and as it were, translated, uh, you know, uh, some of Kassira's much longer works on the philosophy of symbolic forms um, into, uh, into um, uh, as, it, as it were, a, a, a more digestible form, as well as, it should be said, in, in Langer's case, bringing that theory of symbolism to get together with a whole range of other issues, including the theories of Freud and Jung and many others. And to some degree that, that, that sort of muddied the waters. Um, but it, it certainly must be the case that, that, that Kassira was really crucial for him. I mean, if I might add, the, the other um, source uh, for, for Goethe um, in, in developing his account, I think in particular of the way in which metaphor uh, metonymy and irony 
can create changes in these cultural systems, as he calls them. Um, a big inspiration to him was uh, Paul Ricoeur. And I found in Goethe's archive uh, at Chicago um, a correspondence between the two. And in fact, Goethe was asking for Ricoeur's lectures that were being given, I forget where else in the United States, as he was writing the introduction to uh, the interpretation of cultures, the famous essay on fake description. So, so this too was, I think, another and, and a source which is perhaps surprising, but one I think was was really crucial to um, to Gertz. Um, on Nagara, um, uh, I'm I'm really uh, I'm 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 struck by your comment, but but I, and you can tell me if I've understood you correctly, but but that Gertz thinks. So Goethe's arguing that rituals then aren't, aren't the trappings of power, they're an expression of power. They don't rely upon the pre-existence of a kind of power, but they simply are what make you powerful, right? These, 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 these theatrical uh, performances of power. Um, and Goethe thinks that's the diametrical opposite of the Western state. And, and you're saying, but that actually is the state, that is the source of power, um, if, if, if that's right. And then, so there, there's a kind of irony there that Goethe thinks he's finally escaped the clutches of the state when in fact he's declaring it's fundamental basis. And I think, I mean, that, if, you know, that, that, that sounds like uh, um, a very powerful point. And one, I, I ought to work into this, this, this kind of argument of mine, uh, of mine that in the attempt to escape from um, the standard framework of, of Western political theory, he's in, he's in some sense, binding himself even, even more closely to it. Um, I think that's a really, a really crucial point. So I'll, I'll have to think, think about that further, but thank you so much. Okay, Will Seven. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Just one second. There we go. Um, I guess my question is, is in some ways, um, builds off what both Quentin and Paul asked. And it, it, I mean, maybe maybe the simplest way of putting it would be, what exactly do you mean by the state? Um, and because I think I, my sense, and this is sort of based, bit, and Durkheim is sort of the only figure you talk about who I've read much of. Um, and it seems like in Durkheim, you know, there's a way in which you get rid of the state, but then it just kind of reappears as kind of another cultural system yeah. or something like that. And even in, um, like the elementary forms, right? There's, there still is kind of, there's authority, there's leadership. So there isn't a kind of Hobbesian state. Maybe there isn't even a state, but there is authority and possibly certainly as, you know, things get more complex, there is government. Um, and my sense is that's a kind of widespread move at the end of the 19th century. Um, this sort of, you know, Henry Maine, the challenge to Austin's theory of sovereignty. Um, and continuing into the 20th century. I mean, does, does American political science during this period have a theory of the state or is it just a kind of theory of government? Um, and so, so I guess I'm curious whether, you know, how deep is the sort of, to what extent is this a challenge to the state and to what extent is it sort of just rewriting government in a, diff, in a different way in which it simply becomes one system among many? Yeah, um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're right. I mean, I guess, so what I want to say about that, I mean, I think, right, that um, maybe I would make a distinction, and your, your, your question helps me think, helps me to make this distinction, which is, I guess this is right, I need to think it through more carefully, but, but Malinowski, I think, is describing something more like government. His account of primitive civil law is something more like a kind of, perhaps a more ordinary process of government which sort of, as it were, punts or doesn't really even need to engage the question of sovereignty or it doesn't need to, 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 to engage that question at all, um, perhaps. But, but then the difference is, I think for Goethe, he is much more mindful of a state as, but probably in this sense, and again, I mean, what you're telling me is to be clear about this, which is very helpful. Um, I think it's hard not to be a Weberian in the post-war United States, particularly for an anthropologist about the state because the important thing is the monopoly on the use of religious and force, and whether or not in particular standing armies in the post colonial states were able to do that. Um, and so I think Goethe has in that sense a very big, very practical sense of what the state is and what its limits are. I mean, specifically the problem in many cases in, in these states is that um, 
there isn't an you know that the state doesn't hold the monopoly on the, on the use of additional force or insofar as it does it's because uh, effectively there's some form of military government or other. um so in that sense I, I i think i think it's certainly true that probably Goetz has a more concrete vision of the state um than, than malinovsky um but it just I guess the reason I wanted to keep this language of the state in play in the discussion of Malinowski, um, and, and maybe also for, for Durkheim, is um, so much of what he describes is just straightforwardly describing a system of positive or municipal law, which is very strictly enforced and in which there are various sanctions and banishments and so on that come with breaking the law and so on. But it sounds so much like something like the modern state. It seems one doesn't want to do away with that altogether. But I think making more use of that sovereignty government distinction and suggesting that for that kind of generation of Durkheim and the Durkheimians in France and then the, and then the, the many Durkheimians in this tradition of British <coughs> social anthropology, they are thinking more about government and have a less well-developed conception of the state. So that's, that's a helpful question that I need to be more attentive to. Uh, Niall, and when you speak, could you I'll do a sound up. check? Yeah, could, can everyone in the uh, can everyone online hear Niall? Niall, he's, he's deaf, so he can speak <laughs> extremely loud. That's, That's true. Um, thanks very much for the paper. I just learned so much from that. Um, but I have a, a question. I'm just curious about um, Gert's ideology. So, to create ethnic blocks, you have to construct ideologies. Um, but, um, you know, if I'm thinking I'm, I, I want to be a Goetzean in a post-colonial state, I'd want to have some idea of what kind of ideologies I, I might want to create. And I think you've given some clues. So you said that, um, you know, there are potential in, there's potential in religion. Um, but, you know, that's a pretty general guide and he said something about um, he employs the language of country and town rather than um, rather than the state so could you just put some flesh on the bones of that you know what he means by ideologies um, yes yeah, yeah yeah thank you and so this is where I'll, I'll that's a very um, important question um, and I, I may because I'm, I'm no one's idea of an Indonesianist, I'll be less comfortable, you know, and, and, and I should say that Goethe does, in that essay on ideology as a cultural system, he has this brief segue into five incipient forms of ideology in Indonesia that could be rendered sort of safe for something like a, a, like a, like a, like a mass politics. So, okay, so he thinks that and this comes out of his, of his early, uh, of, of his doctoral work, um, he thinks that there is a strand of reformist Islam, uh, most identified with, with um, the, this is the language he uses, the, the, the century Muslims in Java, um, who are um, less, let's say, doctrinaire, less strict, more oriented towards um, entrepreneurship and the benefits of trade and, um, economic organization into something like a firm type form. And he thinks, I mean, actually, this is more in his work on economic development. He thinks that's one of the great hopes for Indonesia is that kind of Islam, um, uh, you know, yeah, as I say, like a, a non-doctrinaire form of Islam could be the, the way forward for Indonesia. Um, another example he gives is, um, so there are these, youth clubs, which are very important in post Indonesia, which are called uh, Alirans. And some of them are religious, some of them are not, some of them are more political. One of the political ones is called um, the Panchasila, which is, I think, still in Indonesia, although, again, you know, any people correct me, because I'm definitely above my pay grade here, um, has since become, you know, oh, Sorry, I'm just to you, but it, well, okay, you know what I'm going to say. But at the time, let's say, um, it was seen as potentially becoming not a nationalist culture, but something like a patriotic one that would rise above any particular 
religious affiliation, whether Muslim or Hindu or whichever branch of, of Islam, um, and that could bind people together. There was also finally some degree of hope, although this was already changing in the early 60s, that um, socialism of some kind, um, and of course, you know, communist parties in particular were, you know, beginning to emerge. Um, that, that there was there was some hope that some of the socialist groups could also provide a basis for a kind of mass politics, which could, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that could become this basis for a more ideological politics. But I, I, I get, as I'm saying this, right, I, I keep invoking the term, and what does it mean? And I guess for, for some of those, I hope I've given some examples there of, you know, Panchasila nationalism, of reform uh, Islam in Indonesia, and to some degree, you know, secular left political parties. Um, but what what um, what Gers has in mind is what he thinks happened in the United States, which is, you know, there's this, I mean, the, the important discussion after World War II of how various, what were before World War II in the United States, very strict dividing lines between, you know, um, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, German Americans, you know, Jews, and even within that, you know, in, in, in the great migration to the United States of 1880s to 1920, you know, German Jews versus Jews from, you know, the Pale Settlement region and so on, all of these things, the differences there in the United States, the ethnic politics made a huge difference. And then suddenly after World War II, all of those groups, while not entirely getting rid of the categories of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, get dissolved into this white ethnic category that becomes uh, general enough that if you're Catholic, and you're in New York, and you're a Democrat, and if you're Jewish and you're in on the West Coast, you're the the, the some of the finer grained differences and the the kind of social conflicts that produced get buried beneath this kind of general category of white ethnic, and that, according to Will Herberg, and also some historians after uh, who work on the post World War United States, that that led to this form of more stable mass politics, two big two big political parties, and it drains some of the conflict from what was actually, you know, a kind of tinderbox of left and right in the United States during the Great Depression. And I think Gertz has in mind the possibility of a process like that. Um, so I, I hope that begins to answer. Well, what he's realizing is he's even writing this is, you know, the purges begin in 65, 66, and he's seeing this division between the nationalist and the communist, which is becoming the basis for civil war, and then in the end, the purges of, of communists in Indonesia. So, yeah. John Dunn, and I'm afraid, John, you'll have to speak uh, very loudly for the room to hear. Uh, uh, and oh, I, I can't. hold on, John, one second. We can't seem to hear you, but you're not muted. So I don't know why that's happening. Bear, bear with us one second. John, I don't know if the, if there's an issue with your mic. Can anyone else hear John? No. Um, we do have one other question. What I propose, John, if you can fiddle with your mic in the settings in the interim, because we can't hear you, I'll come back to you after uh, Andrew Fitzmorris. I hope that's okay. Um, I, I'd suggest we... This being our last seminar, we run on for a, a couple of extra minutes at least. Yeah. Um, uh, I, well, that's up to the people in the audience, I suppose. Um, Andrew Fitz Morris, and John will come back to you. Sorry about that. Okay, I actually was starting. I thought we'd pass the time. I was going to let this drop, but uh, more about the state. But just, I mean, it takes a very narrow focus, doesn't it, to think about Western political thoughts and, and entirely focused upon the state. And you mentioned Frederick Cooper, but I was also, when you were speaking, and thinking about the context in which Malinowski was writing, just, for example, pluralists like Harold Lasky and um, Ernst Barker, so thinking about the church, uh, trade unions, and various other forms of association as places in which politics can happen uh, separate from the state and just to a large degree in terms of statistics. And it just put that got me thinking, is that do these anthropologists belong to a much 
from the deeper within. That are not related, never mind a state, but something in it, not dependent upon the constitution. Yeah, um, two things. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, the reason I, I focused in on this question of the state, and I do sort of accept, certainly accept, that, you know, that my treatment of it was extremely brief, certainly too generic. But one reason I focused on that is because I do think, and I, I, a longer version of this paper does have a discussion of authors like Marshall Salins and Jim Scott, is that they are obsessed with refusing course, mm -hmm. <laughs> and specifically in putting culture in place of something like the need for a for an explicit constitution or a, or a kind of covenant to mm -hmm. count the state. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that there, there is a concern, but of course, I mean, it's not only that that kind of view is by no means inconsistent with some of these pluralist interests that you just described, but in fact, in many ways follow, follow from it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, insofar as I understand um, the views of Durkheim and people around, you know, the, the circle of Durkheim in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they're all interested in precisely questions of the importance of the association and intermediary institutions in the French state as ways of balancing out the power of centralized authority. And so, I mean, I think that Morse, you know, in the 20s is writing about, I mean, uh, I mean in defense of new economic policy in Russia, but also in, in defense of uh, the importance of non-state associations and creating and maintaining political order. So I, certainly you can see them as uh, emerging from and engaging in that, broad, that broader associationist or pluralist um, history. Um, I, I guess the, the change comes, and again, um, this maybe gets me back to Will's point and tells me I need to do more to make clear the importance of the break of the Second World War. And, you know, there are all ways of marking that break, both obviously politically with this kind of, you know, the, the, the collapse of various schemes for forms of federalism to, to take place in empire, in the rise of the nation state, but also in intellectual history, I suppose books like Collingwood's The New Leviathan, you can see the state is, you know, with a vengeance back on the agenda of World War II. Mm -hmm. And then I think people like Gertz and, uh, and others come back to, I mean, it's fine if you want to be a kind of pluralist after World War II, but you also have to recognize the overwhelming fact that the state becomes this thing that you can grab and use to do things in mm. the global south. And so you have to have a theory of it and its limits. And so, so then the post-war period in that sense is sort of different. And I you know, yeah. certainly don't pretend to have untangled all of those. But I, but I definitely think I could, I could say things that are um, consistent with, with, with the, the point that you make about the, some of the pluralist origins and almost, you know, Ways of thinking beyond the state, uh, you know, that, that are that are that are at the heart of some of these anthropological ideas. Even though it's still the case, just like you know, Lasky and Cole and so on, you know, they're all happy to take a swipe at the concept of sovereignty mm -hmm. whenever they can. So that's still in play in all of these works too. Thank you. Okay, so uh, John, uh, Dan, if we can try again, let's see if. Um... We can hear you. Um, so if you want to, you are unmuted, I think. Uh, John, if you if you can write uh, very briefly in the chat, I can read it out to everyone. Gonna leave 10 awkward seconds. I'm not sure John is still on the call or able to hear us. Got it. Okay, thanks, John. So the question John Don wants to ask is whether by the end of his inqu inquiries, Gert still believed, as he clearly did at the beginning, that he possessed a potentially directive approach to the question of what to do in the range of societies he was considering. Thanks, John. Um, sorry, could you, just, could you just read that again? Of course. Um, whether by the end of his inquiries, Goethe still believed, as he clearly did at the beginning, that he possessed a potentially directive approach to the question of what to do in the range of societies he was considering. Right. Um, thank you. That's all. I mean, my, 
my the short answer is I don't believe he did. And, and in fact, I think the, the the example of how he kind of abandons that direct that view that there is something directive in his theory, which I which I certainly believe he, he did have in the 50s and 60s, is is his book on Nagara, this this book on the theatrical state in 19th century Bali. When he writes this, I still think very, very, very interesting essay, The Integrative Revolution in 65, which he updates in 73, which is a, very, a kind of panoramic survey of the challenges of, of, of integrating civic politics with so-called primordial, primordial ties, not just in Indonesia, but in Morocco, um, in, in, a, in a number of post-colonial states. Um, when, when, he, when he writes that essay, um, he, he gives us as an example of the possibility um, of, um, of, of, a, of a kind of emergent principle of social integration, this idea of the Nagara, of the, the idea of the exemplary center in which the, the performance, the display of power is itself power, it's an ordering force within the state, as, as Gertz describes it. Um, he thinks that idea is in the process of being not, not taken over directly, but kind of expanded, becoming a kind of trope that could itself once again become a kind of ideology or, or ordering force within Indonesia. Um, and by the time he writes Nagara, he doesn't even talk about that possibility and maybe why it failed in the 20th century. The book ends, I think it's in the, it's in, it's in the early 19th century, or at least it's in the middle. It's, he just does away with modernity. I mean, in fact, he, I think he starts when the Dutch begin seriously commercially developing um, Java and some of the outer islands for cash crop exports. And so he just won't touch it, which suggests to me that possibility of a more directive approach is just kind of gone for, for him. Um, so, and I think again, as I you know, sort of gestured towards at, at the end of the, the paper, um, I think uh, he just came to realize that even, um, you know, his attempt to tell the development economists, you're going to need an anthropologist on your team because you're going to need to understand how culture works so that, you know, in a sense, where to put the money, <laughs> where to give the money to. He recognizes that even if you did that, which never happened anyway, even if you did that, um, it wouldn't solve the increasingly intractable political problems that he's seeing after the 70s and the turn towards military dictatorship um, in South America, in, um, in Indonesia and elsewhere. And so I, I think he abandons that view and instead, you know, this is speculative, but I, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for it. He becomes what he's allowed to be at the Institute, which is the guru of methodology and the person who gets to say to political theorists, you know, you're working with universals, you're generalizing from a paradigm case, and we ought to think instead about, you know, a mishmash of possible political forms, um, you know, the, 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 the sociological organization of towns as opposed to thinking about cities or countries instead of nations. So all of these ideas, he sort of just gets to say, you know, we have to abandon the, the kind of comforts of high mid 20th century political and social science um, and recognize, you know, he calls it the, the jumble. Um, and I think that's because the, the task of being directive is all but impossible. Or at least I might say, the only people who think they can be directive are Okay, thank you, Joel, for a really rich and fascinating paper. And thanks to you all for joining us for the last uh, seminar of the academic year, including our online audience. Uh, all that remains is to thank Joel for his paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.